Welcome back to our learning course. In this lesson, we will see how we can use the Roscola Wagner model to understand how animals learn actions in instrumental conditioning. We won't need a lot of new ideas for this. First of all, you may wonder why we need anything new at all to understand how animals learn in instrumental conditioning. Don't we already know how animals learn actions from our study of Pavlovian conditioned responses? It is true that Pavlovian CRs are actions, but one reason why Pavlovian conditioning is traditionally studied separately from instrumental conditioning is that Pavlovian actions are not flexible. Once we have decided to use a CS and a US, the CRs that the animals learn are pretty much fixed. The table shows some typical examples. The point is that you cannot use the bell and food, for example, to train eye blink, taste aversion, or anything else that the animal does not learn spontaneously when you use a bell and food. Instead, we know that in instrumental conditioning, we can train many different behaviors. We saw in our first lesson on instrumental conditioning that we still cannot train completely arbitrary actions, but still there is a lot more flexibility than in Pavlovian conditioning. For example, it's almost impossible to train a chicken to move away from food when you reward it with food, but you can still train it to do a number of different things, like pecking at various objects, climbing on a box, turning around, and so on. So the goal of this lesson is to understand how these flexible actions can be learned. Before going into how an instrumental action can be learned, let's recall something from our lesson, Do Animals Imagine the Future? In that lesson, I discussed how instrumental conditioning involves three elements. There is a response, R, that we want to reward, like a lever press in this example. Then there is a stimulus, S+, plus, that represents the reward, like food. Lastly, there is a stimulus S that enables the animal to distinguish situations where the response is rewarded from situations where it is not. For example, it is common to reward a lever press only if a light is on. In this case, the stimulus S would be the light. Given these three elements, we saw that learning could mean a couple of different things. It could mean that the animal connects in its mind the light and the lever press so that it will press whenever it sees the light or it could connect the lever press with the food, so that it would think about pressing whenever it wants the food. I also noted that both connections could be formed at the same time, and that what exactly happens is still a matter of discussion among scientists. We can recall also that a similar discussion exists for Pavlovian conditioning. In that case, we brushed it aside and said, well, there is something that changes during learning, so let's not care for now about what it is. We will just call it associative strength and try to understand how it changes. We are going to use the same trick with instrumental conditioning. We are not taking a position about what is learned exactly in instrumental conditioning. You can find that discussion in the lesson, Do Animals Imagine the Future? In this lesson, we are happy to say there is some kind of associative strength that changes during instrumental conditioning, and this change is what we want to understand. This is helpful because we already have a nice model of how associative strength may change, and this is the Roscoe and Wagner model. It turns out that we can still use it for instrumental conditioning. As I mentioned on the previous slide, we can still think of an associative strength that changes, and we can also continue to use the error as a guiding principle for learning. For example, imagine the usual rat in the usual Skinner box where it can press a lever to get food. At the beginning of training, the rat does not know that pressing the lever produces food. Suppose that at some point it presses the lever by accident and gets food. At this point, we can say that the rat has made an error, not in the sense that something bad happened, but in the sense that pressing the lever had a meaningful consequence, the food that the rat did not expect. The rat thought that pressing the lever had no value, but it turns out that that was wrong. In fact, we can interpret the associative strength, V, as the value that the rat gives to pressing the lever. This gives us a good intuition of what the error is about in instrumental conditioning. In practice, this would mean that the rat increases the associative strength if something better than expected occurs, and it decreases it if something worse than expected occurs. This is essentially all there is to use in the Roscoe and Wagner model for instrumental conditioning, but there is still one small missing piece. How does the rat choose what to do? 
we did not have to bother with this in Pavlovian conditioning because, as we said earlier, the conditioned response is not really chosen. It is always the same. So we are back to asking how animals can make decisions. The idea is still to use the associative strength. This is easy to understand if we interpret the associative strength as the value that the animal gives to the action. It is natural to think that the animal will choose more often the actions with a higher value. For simplicity, assume that there are only two possible actions that I will call push and pull. So the animal has to choose between pushing and pulling something. A simple rule that works well is to say that the animal chooses each action in proportion to its value. The mathematical formula for two actions is this one on screen. The probability that the action chosen is push is the associated strength of push, V push, over the sum of the associated strength of push and the associated strength of pull. Let's see why this makes sense with a few examples. When you have a new formula like this one, it's a good idea to check that it makes sense. For example, if the two Vs are the same, exactly the same, there should be no preference for pushing or pulling. In fact, we can check that if you use the same number here for V push and V pull, you get one half. That is a probability of 50% of doing either action. So this worked well. What about when an action has a zero value and the other has a positive value? We expect the positive value action to be chosen. In this case, we get in fact that if V push is zero, then the probability of pushing is zero. But if V pull is zero, then you have two numbers that are equal here, so the probability is one, or 100%. So between two actions, whichever one is zero is never chosen, and the other one, provided that its value is not zero, is chosen all the time. Now that we have some confidence that the formula makes sense, we can use it to calculate other probabilities. For example, if pushing is worth twice as much as pulling, then its probability will be two-thirds, and the probability of pulling one-third. In other words, the probability of pushing will be twice as much as the probability of pulling. If you remember our lesson on decision-making in animals, this is exactly what happens, at least most of the time, with the matching law. You can refer to that lesson and see the connection between the matching law and our rule for choosing actions. Before we move on, I will warn you that this formula over here is not exactly what scientists would use. It is good enough for our purposes, but it has some problems. For example, you can get weird results if some of the values are negative. But we won't bother with this in our course. Just know that there are ways to fix these problems. And here is what learning looks like when you put everything together. This is a learning curve for an instrumental associative strength, learned in the way we just described by using the Roscoe wagner learning rule plus our new rule for choosing which action to perform. It looks similar to the learning curves that we have seen for the Roscoe wagner model. Because it's still based on the error principle, the curve grows more quickly at the beginning when the error is large and more slowly as the error gets smaller. The main difference is that the Roscoe wagner learning rule goes up smoothly but this one goes up in steps. The reason is that RW assumes that V changes whenever the CS and US are experienced, while the instrumental associative strengths change only when the action is performed. For example, if we look over here at the beginning, the response is very rare because its associative strength is small. As long as the response is not performed, nothing happens, as you see here for the first about 20 time units. But at some point, around the time 20, our simulated rat decides to press the lever, and it is rewarded for doing so. At this point, we can see that the associative strength jumps from 0 to 0.1. This is exactly what you expect from the Roscoe wagner learning rule, because in this example, I am using a lambda value of 1 and the combined alpha and beta terms of 0.1. So the error is 1 and the learning rate is 0.1, and multiplied together, they give a jump of 0.1 here. After this first jump, the probability of choosing the action is still low. It's about 10%, because the associative strength is still 0.1. So some time passes before the animal actually tries the response again, and during this time, again, nothing happens. But when the action is tried again, there is another jump. After the first few responses, the associative strength has grown enough that the response is tried out regularly, and from there on, learning proceeds pretty smoothly, more or less like in the Roscoe-Wagner model. 
In conclusion, we have seen that we can use the Rescone Wagner learning rule also in instrumental condition. We only need to add one detail, that instrumental actions need to be chosen by the animal in order to be learned about. You cannot discover that lever pressing gives food if you never try to press the lever. One consequence of this is that the associative strength for an instrumental response can grow only when the response is tried out. In contrast, in Pavlovian conditioning, we have seen that the Rescola Wagner model says that the associative strength between CS and US grows every time the CS and US are presented. It does not matter whether the animal makes a condition response or not. And this means that the Pavlovian conditioning learning curve predicted by the Rescola Wagner model is smooth rather than stepwise. But we have also seen that this picture might actually be too simple even for Pavlovian conditioning. There might be stepwise changes in Pavlovian conditioning too, and this is covered in the lesson What Triggers Pavlovian Conditioning. Other lessons to study next are those about condition reinforcement and about learning values, which will be similar to learning associative strength. This lesson is over. Happy learning to everyone.